This has been a week where the possibility of new beginnings has lingered in the air. Cruelly, perhaps, because though it may be getting lighter and the number of vaccines ever greater, we may be further away from complete escape from the COVID darkness than we think. First things first, the good news. Good news is that cases are down to about 19 thousand a day that's down about 70 percent on the month 26 percent on the seven day rolling average but look at the line that is still at levels that we were seeing in early december so it still has to come down somewhere yet and then look at this line this line shows you the number of covid patients in hospital that's declined as well it's come down a bit and yes it is a lagging indicator so it should come down further with cases but it is still north of thirty thousand. People in Whitehall want to get it south of 10,000 before there's any significant relaxation. So still some way to go. This is echoed by what the scientists are saying behind closed doors as well. Newsnight has seen a draft paper from SPYM, the government's internal modelling service, submitted to SAGE this week. They emphasise that pace will be key. A gradual lifting of restrictions, they say, can maintain hospital occupancy below 10,000, but this requires some measures to persist until 2022. But, you can hear a politician cry, what about the vaccines? Well, the epidemiologists are taking those into account, but they emphasise that longer is still better, illustrating this with a graph showing different unwinding scenarios, one over three months, one over six months, one over nine months. And only in nine months does it keep hospital admissions under 10,000, this dotted line at the bottom. They say that's because if we unlock too quickly, there's still a large number of people in vulnerable groups without direct protection, either because they have not been vaccinated or because their vaccination has not stopped them becoming ill, nor indirect protection from wider population immunity because many people in younger age groups have not yet been vaccinated. So they add this note of caution. It is much less likely that hospital admissions will reach unsustainable levels if we relax measures based on data, not at predetermined dates. There are lots of unknowns. We have some signs that the, the vaccination may prevent some transmission, but we definitely don't know that yet. Um, we, it's really important to remember that the, even the vaccines we have now are not 100% effective. So people could, some people could still become unwell. We don't know how long the protection lasts. And then, of course, there's the concern about variants and vaccines having to be tweaked and booster doses, etc. So these are lots and lots of questions. And I think until we know more about the answers to those questions, we need to recognize that while we will be able to open up, um, we won't be able to do that fully really for quite some time. There are lots of caveats to all this. This is difficult stuff to model. The scientists can't be certain of everything or indeed anything right now. And there are big uncertainties around what effect the vaccine will have on transmissibility and so on. But what you should take away from it is this. It appears that internally, scientists are advising as much caution as possible and as slow a timetable for unlocking as politicians and policymakers can bear. But we know that increasingly, that's not where the politics is, with the Prime Minister coming under increasing pressure from his backbenches to unwind and unlock as quickly as possible now that cases are firmly coming down. We had an example of that today, with rumours over relaxation for foreign holidays and vaccine passports. Even with relaxation, the prospect then is of a world not like the one we left behind. Effectively, what was one of the UK's most successful industries has just been left to wither. So the government may or may not help, but frankly, I think we will see something of an arms race between different countries who are after those very valuable um, uh, vaccinated tourists. And you're unfortunately going to have a situation where you're going to have the jabbed and the jabbed not. It all seems tantalizingly close, a life once lived. We might, though, need to adjust ourselves to the possibility that it is further away than it feels. Lewis Goodall reporting the government told us it's following the science and the Prime Minister will set out plans of releasing the lockdown in the week beginning the 22nd of February. In a moment, we'll be talking about the prospect of vaccine passports, but first to discuss the spy and modelling on the future spread of the virus. I'm joined now by Dr Mike Tilsley from the University of Warwick, who is a member of the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Modelling Group, the committee that feeds into SAGE. Uh, good evening, Mike Tilsley. Uh, just to be clear here, the modelling suggests that we cannot get carried away with the idea that the vaccine will quickly give us freedom. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, what we need to remember, of course, is, you know, at the moment we are seeing that the R number is slightly below one. We know that we're having more vaccinations. And of course, you know, if we achieve that 15 million doses by mid-February, which actually we're on pretty well on target to do so, we would expect to see number of cases coming down as they are. And of course, the pressure coming off the hospitals and the number of deaths going down. But that's contingent upon the level of control that we have. If we start to relax control too rapidly, then the gains we would get from vaccination would be offset by the fact that everyone's mixing so, that much more. So, so that's the real it, concern. So increasing, we see that the scientists might be at odds with the politicians. Well, uh, I, I mean, I would certainly say that what we really need to do is I, I totally understand that we want to try to get back to normal, but the real danger is if we relax too rapidly, we'll get a resurgence and we'll end up going into another lockdown. So we really need to ease out of this very carefully so that we don't lose the gains we get from vaccination by allowing people to mix more rapidly and spreading the virus more. So presumably this is not good news for business, not good news for employment or indeed for families having big get togethers again. And, and, and this is the real challenge. But of course, if we end up unlocking too rapidly and we see the hospitals overwhelmed again in April, and the number of deaths sadly going up, we could have another lockdown. And of course, that's also not good news for businesses and families. So I think we all appreciate that we want to get back to normal. But by doing it more gradually, we have a much better chance of hopefully getting back to normal and staying at a normal and, level. And when we looked last summer at the eat out to help out, you know, the outdoor gatherings, some indoor gatherings, was that actually now a very big mistake? Well, again, I mean, it's the same thing that a lot of us were saying really back then that really, you know, there's one, there's a very key mantra when it comes to control. You, you implement and control policy rapidly and you relax it gradually. So back last summer, we very much went from everyone stays at home and you need to stay at home to almost encouraging people to go out to the pub, increasing mixing. And of course, when September came around, we saw cases starting to rise again, and this is definitely something we want to avoid doing again this time. Well, that's interesting, Zenza. You would probably suggest, unless there was some massive change, then things like eat out to help out would not be a good idea this summer. Never mind going on, as we will do in a second, to talk about vaccine passports. Well, I mean, I certainly wouldn't encourage the eat out to help out this summer. I think, you know, hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful by the summer we can get to some level of normalcy, at least within our own country, International travel is more difficult, but I think the key thing we should be talking about now actually is getting our children back into school. Yeah. That would be very much the first thing we should think about. And then all the other things we think about later once we've got our children safely back into school. Well, we're going to be going on to talk about these vaccine passports, Mike Tilsley. In your view, are vaccine passports a good idea or not? And we're not talking about in a year's time. We might even be talking about for other countries in a few weeks' time. I mean, to me, the one reason you might want to consider it is to try to improve uptake. I think it's one of the things we're really concerned about, particularly when we get to younger people, is that they may feel that, you know, they're not going to be severely affected by COVID, so they don't need the vaccination. And we need to do something to explain to people that actually we need really, really high levels of uptake across the population so that we can ease out of these restrictions as soon as possible. Mike Tizzi, thank you very much for joining us. Well, I'm joined now by Claire Wenham, Assistant Professor of Global Health Policy at the LSE, and by Jose Ramon Bauza, the Spanish MEP, who sits in the EU's Committee for Transport and Tourism and who was formerly the Balearic President. Uh, good evening uh, to both of you. Uh, Jose Ramon Bauza, do you support vaccine passports for Spain? Yes, yeah, current, but not only for for Spain, for the whole for the uh, European Union. We are working very hard to ensure the establishment of freedom of movement in the EU and with other third countries like UK as well, of course, and gradually return to normality for the transport and tourism sector before the summer season. The European Union needs to take advantage of the vaccination success in countries like UK or Israel in order to attract tourism tourism from those countries in the coming month. It's absolutely important for us. So you think the people of Spain, I know tourism is so important to you, the people of Spain will be happy to welcome any tourists in who have a vaccine passport? Yes, of course. You know, uh, the tourism sector has been absolutely dramatic damage. Uh, damage. Uh, for example, here in the Balearic our, our figures have, uh, in incomes are less than 90% compared to the, with the last year. In the whole Spain, more or less 80, 85% in order. Yes, you have to know that is so important if almost 15% uh, of our GDP is in link and involved with the tourism sector and so, so, so important for us. But 
we know, or we're being told now, that despite the vaccine, people can still be infectious. So what you're prepared to accept is people from the UK, for example, coming into the country, albeit vaccinated, but who could still be infectious. Sorry, can, can you repeat? I, I didn't hear you quite well. We're being told that despite the fact that people are vac vaccinated, the vaccine yes. does not necessarily um, ensure that people who have had the vaccine are not carrying coronavirus and can infect others with coronavirus. Is Spain appeared to accept that risk? Well, I can, I can uh, talk with you as a pharmacist, and pharmacists as well, a uh -huh. part of political, but, a politician. But I, I must say that all the, 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 the studies are telling us that people who have has been vaccinated has less less possibilities to be infected or, be, or to infect more people. That's also important that people have incurred professor before before my journal of, 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 the, of the floor. And it's so important. I absolutely agree with him that Young people, in fact, young people have to be very well explained in order to be vaccinated. But it's so, so important because if you are not vaccinated, you have a high risk not only to, to infect, but infect to other people. Mm -hmm. And the last studies for all the different companies, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, or the other, are telling us that people with vaccinated is almost in order to so not have the possibility to be infected. Right, let's talk about the people who are not necessarily going to be vaccinated. You have an older population who, if with a vaccine passport, would presumably come. But what about young people who come in their thousands, particularly to the Balearics in the summer, who might not be vaccinated? Are you going to welcome people in that are not vaccinated? Let's see. We, when we are talking about the certificate, what we're talking is a large percentage of elderly people for countries such as UK will be vaccinated, and many of them are potential tourists to travel every year to Spain, the Balearic, or the Canary Islands, or that. Therefore, the certificate is a very good opportunity to ensure that people can travel safety and start to establish tourism, as we told you. But it is this one of the most practical applications that we are currently having the pipeline to restore traveling without mm -hmm. discrimination. People, those people who are not vaccinated, maybe who they they are, they are not in the line to be vaccinated. They need more time to, 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 to be vaccinated or even they can be vaccinated for different situations. They can still uh, fly. They can still move. They can still uh, do tourism because they, what they have to do is following the current healthy measures in place such as testing or sort quarantine. But for us, it's so important that we can stop yeah. this right. possibility of people who is vaccinated in order to, 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 to to, to turn on the line or the wheel to, to the tourism, to the economy and thank the possibility to fly. Jose Ramon, thank you very much. Indeed. Claire Wenham, can I turn to you? What do you think of the idea of a vaccine passport? I just think it's a bit dangerous. I mean, we don't want people's health status to be determining their participation in social and economic life. And we know there's particular groups who won't be able to get vaccinated for, for medical reasons, for example. And we also know that, you know, if we look at other play, other instances where we've seen these vaccination certificates that people keep referring to for polio, for yellow fever, we haven't been up against a finite resource of that vaccine supply. And so now we're going to have to see, you know, the, the rollout of this is going to take time. And so we're going to see those who are unable to get vaccinated be penalised until such point as they can. And that's both within the UK, younger populations, for example, but also globally, you know, people who are from low middle income countries who aren't going to get the vaccine for a year or two, they're not going to be able to have the same rights as other people. And it just seems we're bringing more discrimination uh, and potentially challenges into the process. What if the government believes that liberty, for some, trumps inequality? Well, I just think that's really unfortunate. I mean, the only thing that this outbreak has shown us is by how much inequality we have in our society. It's really exposed that by who's becoming infected, who's most affected by all the different interventions we've had. And we shouldn't be introducing more policies which are going to make that worse for the most marginalised in our societies. So that's interesting. So actually, a vaccine passport could act almost like an ID. And if you don't have that ID, you could be excluded. You could be excluded, I don't know, maybe from certain shops, from certain activities. That's what you're suggesting entrenches inequality in that way as well. Well, absolutely. We've already seen rumours of certain companies, for example, requiring uh, a vaccination certificate or immunity certificate for, for being able to use their services, such as Qantas Airlines. 
I've also heard cinemas talk about it. And, you know, that it only takes one step for that to kind of get rolled out and you have employers saying you must be vaccinated. And we don't want to be in that position. I'm a firm believer in vaccines, but not everybody feels that way. And we don't have mandatory vaccination in this country. And so we need to make sure that we are working with communities so people get the vaccine, but we don't discriminate for people who well, can't for medical reasons, for that, example. That, that uh, could cause this issue, which is that there is no public uh, vaccine uh, certificate or vaccine passport, like much like your driving license. But presumably there's absolutely nothing to stop the private sector going ahead and doing this themselves. Bro no, broadly. Of not. Like or an maybe app. That's Thing the government should be looking into right why why you know we don't do we want to have that kind of you know freedom for companies to be able to do that and i think the next part of this is you know what for what happens for example if one vaccine works better for some variants mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. others or future variants that might emerge is it going to say on your vaccine passport which vaccine you might have had and then you know would you have a situation where you know the eu would say you can come in if you've had the pfizer vaccine but not the astrazeneca but, vaccine but surely, i just think it raises a lot of difficulties but surely the other side of of that coin is that employers might prefer to ensure the safety of their employees and for that reason they have an ID to show that they have been vaccinated because as we were just talking about earlier we are understand that there is nothing to suggest that having had the vaccine you yourself do not carry the uh, coronavirus within you and have the ability to pass it on. Absolutely. I think it just we need we just need to think about this and think through all the potential implications of it and make sure there are firm equality impact assessments done on any proposals to bring in such certification so that we don't marginalize people further and we do our best to protect the population, uh, you know, global global population and national populations. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed.